Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJTV News. Anchoring tonight is Michael Hill. Good evening and welcome to NJTV News. I'm Michael Hill. Thanks for joining us. The death toll rises. Today, for the first time, health officials are reporting probable COVID-19 deaths, meaning they reviewed death certificates for more accurate reporting and included more specific information of those who died in long-term care facilities that had outbreaks. Here's what this all means. A clearer toll this pandemic has taken on the state. Officials are reporting an additional 1,854 probable COVID-19 deaths since this outbreak began. With these numbers, the total COVID-19 deaths in our state is 14,872. Health officials today also reported 406 new confirmed cases across New Jersey. Total infections now for the Garden State, 170,196. And here's what's also rising, the rate of transmission from 0.81 to 0.88. Over the past week, the transmission rate has increased in 16 of the state's 21 counties. Six counties now recording rates of transmission at least 50% greater than they were last Wednesday. The rate of transmission has increased in 16 of our counties, with six counties now recording rates of transmission at least 50% greater than they were last Wednesday. Remember, daily positivity and rate of transmission, I would say along with new hospitalizations, Judy, I think we'd agree with that, uh, are the greatest indicators of COVID-19 spread in the here and now. And we have done, and you all have done extraordinary work to push these numbers down to where we are now able to get our restart and recovery moving, but we cannot let up even for one day with our social distancing. We need you to ask to wear these face coverings and wear them properly. Wash your hands with soap and water. If you don't feel well, stay away from other people. And everyone should go out and get tested. If you were at a crowded bar or a restaurant, you should get tested. If you're at a protest, go get tested. Everyone should know if they are carrying the coronavirus. And as Judy pointed out the other day, we are seeing an alarming increase in the number of younger residents testing positive. Folks who I think feel that may, they may be invincible. Uh, so be careful of that. And that means that where there are others who are unknowingly, by the way, carrying the virus and who are at risk of spreading it to others. The reproduction rate is one of the key metrics Governor Murphy routinely has held up as success in battling the virus. But the toughest task will be reversing the current trend and preventing a second wave as more of society reopens. One way to do that, the travel advisory issued by New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. It requires 14-day quarantines for folks coming from several states with cases on the rise, including Texas, where the governor has just halted reopening. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has a closer look at the state's effort to mitigate future risk. I don't know if I'm getting out of here. I, I don't know what I'm going to do today. Arizona resident Deborah Fisher landed at the airport in Newark to suddenly confront New Jersey's new 14-day COVID quarantine. It's imposed on travelers from states with raging outbreaks, including the Carolinas, Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Fisher found no signs explaining quarantine rules and figured she'd ask at her hotel. I don't know financially how I would do that. I have daughters. I have, there's no one I can contact for the money, and I certainly don't have the savings to do that at hotel rates here. Governor Murphy calls his tri-state quarantine with New York and Connecticut an advisory. He won't set penalties for violations like Governor Cuomo did, and he won't corral COVID carriers on the turnpike, but he warns the health commissioner can act. Not as a broad population to put up borders that are uh, put up guard, guards at, a, at the borders of the state of New Jersey, but to single out 
non-compliant behavior and take very explicit, tough action. Meanwhile, the move turned the tables on states like Florida, which imposed quarantines on New York metro travelers back when the virus roared through this region. If you live in one of those states, don't come to New Jersey. Jersey travelers returning from hotspot states face the same quarantine. I mean, I'm totally compliant, whatever it takes, I'm in agreement. The situation is how it is, and if that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do. Unfortunately, it's great. You know, we have to do it to stay safe and keep others safe. But it's not really the quarantine that experts are focused on. New virus models suggest that the fate of New Jersey rests mostly in the hands of its residents and whether they mask up and social distance. The future can really spin on itself really quickly. Um, because this disease is so infectious. Jonathan Christ Tompkins crunches COVID numbers and says for weeks, data showed New Jersey moving in the right direction with one of the lowest infection growth rates in the nation. But as the state reopens, numbers are creeping up. Infection growth rates are higher today in 16 of 21 counties. So he commends Jersey's strong testing and contact tracing programs. At least if the disease starts increasing, you're able to to monitor that. You, you've got surveillance. You know what is happening. Private long-range forecasts provided by the governor's office predict two scenarios for a second New Jersey COVID wave. They depend on residents wearing masks and social distancing through the entire month of July. If people do, new hospital cases could peak at about 700 by mid-April 2021. If people don't comply, models show a steep rise in COVID hospitalizations through fall, spiking to almost 5,000 next spring. Count me as concerned. Uh, so please, folks, continue to do the right things. The behavior you see now predicts the future. Dr. Stephen Sharis heads the Atlantic Medical Group. He says Jersey hospitals are all prepping for the worst, stockpiling ventilators and PPEs, working supply chains with hard-won expertise. We're ready. The health system in New Jersey is ready. The government in New Jersey is ready. Are the citizens of New Jersey ready? Will they do their part? Sheriff says he hopes Jersey residents will prove they remember the hard lessons learned during the COVID surge. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. One person we already know refusing to comply with the governor's order, the president. The White House says the president is an essential worker and does not have to quarantine for two weeks when he arrives tomorrow at his Bedminster Golf Club. At midnight, New Jersey, New York and Connecticut began ordering travelers from several states with rising COVID-19 cases to self-quarantine. The president just held a rally in Arizona where the coronavirus infection rate is spiking. The White House says the president is not a civilian and anyone close to him is tested and confirmed negative. Governor Murphy says the quarantine order does have a carve out for essential workers. One week from today, Atlantic City is going to look a whole lot different. The empty, dark streets of the quarantine will shine bright once again as most casinos open their doors on July 2nd. But there is a ton of work to do over the next week to prepare to welcome back customers, even at 25% capacity. Raven Santana takes us on a tour inside the Ocean Resort Casino with CEO Terry Glabaki as workers finalize the changes to keep customers safe. Let's talk about some of the changes that you've made. Uh, absolutely. Um, as soon as you enter the casino, you're going to see that we've been hard at work. We've been closed for over three months. We've been making sure that everything is ready, looking forward for this big weekend. So when you come in, you'll see over 200 hand sanitizer stations throughout the property. Um, face masks will be required. So I'm wearing a mask, you're wearing a mask. Our guests and our employees will all be wearing masks. We're actually doubling the size of our environmental staff. So on the casino floor, there'll be twice as many people as we had before. I know the minute that they go to check in, they too will have to, to take a temperature check. Right, so we have instituted thermal scanning for all of our employees. We have a, a special employee entrance and when they come through, there's hand sanitizer as soon as they hit the building, there's thermal scanning and a quick health screening before they're able to go to their assigned position. And in terms of table games, what changes will, you know, will they still be open? Uh, absolutely, table games will be open. It's all pending final protocols, of course, from the state. But you can see what we've done is we've now eliminated every other chair. Social distancing is the key. So as we get up here, you'll, you'll notice 
Um, we're still awaiting final state protocols, so we're not sure what will be required, but we've made the assumption that it's um, at least every other slot machine, if not more. So here you'll see a bank of four. We've put the two machines out of service and we've left the two end caps. If you look over here to the right, it's three and we've gone with every other chair. You'll see that throughout our floor and depending upon what the state comes back to us with, we'll adapt to whatever it is that they require. Terry, when we're talking about crowds, we know that you have to limit the capacity here in the casino. We have the benefit here at Ocean of having a huge footprint. We're one of the largest casino floors in town, so the number, we never hit that occupancy. The fact that we'll be at 25% of that, that seems like a little, it's a huge, huge space. So I don't know that we'll even hit the 25%, but we'll be monitoring it, and if we do, we'll take corrective actions. Are you going to turn people away? What if you do meet that capacity, how will that work in terms of crowd control? So if we do hit that capacity, we'll watch and we'll go on an in and out basis. So as people leave, more people can come in. Now we have over three acres of outdoor space. So if people aren't on the casino floor, they could be in our sky garden. We have outdoor pools. So we're gonna make it comfortable if you're not able to get in right away. It's gonna be a great summer in Atlantic City and especially here at Ocean. We can't wait to have people come back. Well, thank you so much. As you heard, if you are planning to head to this casino, make sure that you have your mask and hand sanitizer packed and hopefully you'll also bring a lot of luck with you. In Atlantic City, Raven Santana, and JTV News. NJ Transit is looking for ways to keep commuters safe. It worked for hospitals and other agencies, and now NJ Transit is trying it, experimenting with ultraviolet C light as a better way to sanitize equipment from the coronavirus. The agency has a deal with Rutgers Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation to determine if the UVC wavelength can effectively kill the virus and where best to place the UVC source in different bus models. The study will run over the next few months. We wanted to see if UV technology would work in the confines of a bus setting. Would it be effective? What are the ranges its effectiveness works at? exactly where would the fixtures be placed to be most effective, and that's exactly what the study is designed to do. New Jersey lawmakers plan to spend $7.7 .7 billion over the next three months to fund state operations. They released their budget plan today on how to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. Their plan is only slightly different from the one the Murphy administration has drafted. NJ Spotlight budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer has been looking over the lawmakers' version. The supplemental spending bill introduced by lawmakers today largely carries out a series of cuts in spending deferrals that were first proposed by the Department of Treasury last month in response to shortfalls caused by the pandemic. But lawmakers are using a slightly more optimistic revenue forecast than Treasury in their bill, and it provides more aid to colleges, both four-year schools and county colleges. They also boost funding for the state's unemployment system as part of an effort to address technology problems that have held up benefits for many out-of-work New Jerseyans during the pandemic. The proposed three-month spending bill is likely to go before both full houses of the legislature early next week. And if it's approved by the governor, it will cover state operations from July 1 through the end of September. And for more of John's in-depth reporting, go to njspotlight.com. A potentially troubling trend for New Jersey's workforce. Jobless claims rose for the second week in a row, despite many businesses reopening in the state. Rhonda Schaffler has the details and the day's top business stories. Rhonda? Michael, the latest on the unemployment front shows continued layoffs in the state. 33,000 residents filed for initial jobless claims in the latest week. It's the second week in a row that we've seen an increase in the number of people filing. The Labor Department is still trying to work its way through some of the more complicated claims. It does have a new call center up and running, but Governor Murphy acknowledged today that for some residents, things aren't moving fast enough. Even with this shift in volume to the call center, we understand that some residents still are experiencing wait times, and for that, we urge your continued patience. We completely respect uh, your uh, frustration, uh, but please bear with us. Since mid-March, nearly 1.3 million New Jersey residents have filed for unemployment benefits, and the state has paid out over $8 billion in claims. 
Nationally, close to 1.5 million Americans filed for new unemployment claims in the latest week, and that was higher than forecast. Unemployment levels remain frustratingly high, even as businesses start to reopen. So why is that? Eileen Keene, the state director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, explains many companies are unable to staff up like they did before the pandemic. You have businesses who made it, they made that milestone. They got to opening day uh, and the PPP grants and loans were very, very helpful. But now that they used up those resources, they're finding that they have to think about laying off perhaps two or three employees because they just don't have the revenue to keep everybody on payroll. Keene says some small business owners don't expect to be where they were before the pandemic until sometime in 2021. One of New Jersey's largest employers is hiring. Amazon is planning to open 14 delivery stations in New Jersey this year. Amazon says it will hire both full and part-time staff, although it hasn't yet said when those jobs will be posted. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at the trading day. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by Hackensack Meridian Health. Cancer doesn't wait, and neither should you. Hackensack Meridian Health nurses are available by phone or by video visit. Please call 551-996-5855. New Jersey's delayed primary election is July 7th, less than two weeks away. All 12 congressional seats are on the ballot, but only two of them appear to be competitive, both in South Jersey with endorsements, mud, money, and mail-in ballots crisscrossing the second and third districts. And Jay Spotlight's editor-at-large, Colleen O'Day, is keeping track of it all. Colleen, if I had to put a headline on what's taking place, it would just be South Jersey politics exclamation mark. The second and third congressional districts, these are some hotly contested races. Yeah, those are definitely the ones. I mean, we have a total of 12 districts. 10 of those have con um, contests either on the Democratic or Republican side, but the, all the uh, attention is really focused on the second and third in Burlington, Ocean, counties and then that that second district is just huge it goes all the way down to uh to Cape May. how much will endorsements matter in these two races you know it certainly seems that um they would matter a lot in i'm, I'm gonna say the the second district more than the third just because um in the second district what you have is really a, a contrast between uh bridget harrison who's gotten the endorsements of most of the Democratic establishment, and Amy Kennedy on the other side, who's gotten endorsements from more of the progressive groups, um, as well as uh, one of the counties. So that, I think, could really be a factor, because in the primaries, the people who vote really are the party uh, faithful, those who are paying attention. And in the third congressional district, uh, on the Republican side, Richter and Gibbs, this is a real, uh, a turn out to be quite a fight. Yeah, that one's that one's gotten pretty nasty. You've got uh, Kate Gibbs putting up a website, uh, Richie Richter, kind of after uh, the old Richie Rich cartoon. Um, you've got you know uh, Richter exploiting some of the the minor legal problems that uh, Kate had back when she was younger. So there's just a lot of mud being thrown around there. Colleen, because of the pandemic, not a whole lot of polling places physically will be will be open. So there's going to be a lot of voting by mail in ballot. What impact is that going to have on these races? Um, so it's, the impact is who is going to be the better candidate at getting folks to send in those ballots. Um, I know that all the campaigns have got their own 
organizations or their own operations where they're trying to motivate their uh, supporters to, to send those ballots in. So it, it really is a very different kind of race than we've seen before in the state. And are the folks really tuned into what's going on in these two congressional district uh, races? You know, pundits are kind of, uh, they're, they're unsure whether people are focusing or whether they're just so um, involved in either um, the pandemic or Black Lives Matter or maybe both that the election is kind of set to the side at the moment. Um, we just don't know. All right. Colleen O'Day. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Michael. You can find all of Colleen's reporting on the new NJ Spotlight and NJ TV News Politics page, stories on the contest, candidate profiles, as well as practical information to help you, the voter, check out your registration, district details, and voting options. So head to njspotlight.com and check it all out. The challenges already were many with addiction in New Jersey and accessing help. COVID-19 has made it worse isolating those afflicted and cutting off treatment for some. Leah Mishkin shows us how both the state and the treatment industry learn to adapt. I think that, that COVID-19 is here for a while and we really have to learn to adapt to it. The pandemic is a challenge for many, coping with fear, anxiety, unemployment, all mixed with isolation. This year, uh, there have already been 1,339 suspected overdose deaths, which is up 20 percent from 2019. According to the State Department of Human Services, calls made to New Jersey mental health cares went up nearly 88 percent in April compared to the same time last year. Calls to NJ Hope Line went up a little more than 14 percent. Dr. Kevin Armington is a primary care physician at Work It Health, an online platform that treats opioid addiction. One of the things that we really need to do in treatment is to help them come out of that isolation and make connections to their medical providers and other people who have the same illness. Dr. Aaron Ron with Caden Health says the one positive impact of COVID-19, he can now prescribe medication-assisted treatment virtually. It gives people with an opioid addiction medications like buprenorphine faster in order to stop the craving. It used to be a requirement that you actually had to go to a physician in order to get the medication in the first visit. Uh, that, now had, that regulation has now been relaxed and uh, is no longer a requirement. So we view that as a very big plus because people now can then get their medication virtually. According to Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, only one quarter of addiction treatment providers in the state are able to prescribe this medication. By relaxing some of the uh, telehealth uh, rules, uh, and increasing the reimbursement and allowing reimbursement for different types of services, we now enable more people to get that, that, that treatment. And my hope is that those uh, changes stay even after COVID. Still, New Jersey Prevention Network CEO Diane Litterer says the lockdown did create new barriers for those without access to computers or the internet to even attend virtual meetings. That human connection with people is really important. So I don't think that the benefits would be 100% telehealth. I think it needs to be a balance. I felt love and I felt human. Bob, a former addict and theater director, says when he was in early recovery, just a simple hug or pat on the back helped him on his journey. He wrote a play called Visions in 1991 about alcohol and drug addiction and is now in virtual rehearsals. Many of the cast, as we communicated through phone while this pandemic is still going on, said it was like a recovery meeting to them. It was, they needed it and they looked forward to it. He now understands the benefits of virtual therapy, but is longing for when his cast and crew can get together in person for some real FaceTime. For NJTV News, I'm Leah Mishkin. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. That's our broadcast tonight. Before we leave you, a quick programming note. Tonight at 6.30, check out our new live YouTube show, Chatbox, with senior correspondent David Cruz. This week, I will be hosting. And then tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, tune in to Reporters Roundtable, also on our YouTube channel. I'm Michael Hill. For the entire news team, thanks for being here.
the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. The Orsted vision is a world that runs entirely on green energy. Located off the coast of Atlantic City, Orsted's Ocean Wind Project will provide renewable offshore wind energy. Jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand. Science and technology innovators. The men and women who provide our skilled labor. And our homegrown champions. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM. We've got New Jersey covered. I've got cancer. I've got cancer treatments you won't find anywhere else. I've got cancer researchers closing in on a cure. I've got cancer, but I've also got a nurse navigator who's there every step of the way. I've got cancer and I'm fighting it. We're fighting it at New Jersey's only NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. If cancer comes into your life, you'll find the most comprehensive care at RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey.